You can watch this and other programs online at booktv.org. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Paul Holden Graeber. I'm the Director of Public Programs here at the New York Public Library, known as Live from the New York Public Library, and I'm really delighted to welcome all of you tonight. Last week, we had the great pleasure of welcoming Olafur Eliasson to discuss the state and fate of the Arctic in a series of programs which will include later this season in December a conversation with Naomi Klein. Olafur was so regretful that he could not stay to hear Muhammad Yunus, a man he deeply admires, whose thought he believes is changing the world. They happen to know each other fairly well. I'm thrilled to welcome the 2006 Nobel Peace Prize winner, Muhammad Yunus, and the author of A World of Three Zeros, The New Economics of Zero Poverty, Zero Unemployment, and Zero Carbon Emissions, a book that he will sign after his conversation with Jeffrey Sachs. I'm also thrilled to welcome Jeffrey Sachs back to this stage. I believe it's his third time. Last time Jeffrey Sachs spoke was in 2009 with Nouriel Rubini, Felix Rotin, Rotin in a conversation moderated by Charlie Rose. And in 2007, he spoke for the first time here with Newt Gingrich. It is always a pleasure to welcome him back. I don't know why I paused there, but somehow I just couldn't quite believe that that did, in fact, happen, but it did. And here we are. Indeed, here we are. Tonight I would like to thank Andrea Young and Whitney Peeling, who both helped so very much to make this evening happen. As always, my gratitude for the continuing generosity of Celeste Bartos and Manaz Ispani Bartos and Adam Bartos for their support of live from the New York Public Library. I am dearly grateful to them. Now, many of you know that for the last seven or eight years, I've asked my guests to give me a biography of themselves in seven words. Uh, if you w wish a haiku or a tweet, if you're very modern. And interestingly enough, sometimes I get two words, sometimes I get 11 words, sometimes I get eight words, even at times I get seven words. In the case of Muhammad Yunus, I got three words, microfinance and social business. In the case of Jeffrey Sachs, I got seven words, teacher, researcher, advisor, advocate, beggar for SDG. Please welcome them both. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, now we have proof that there's progress. <laughs> 2007, Newt Gingrich. 2017, 10 years later, Muhammad Yunus. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> I would call it from the ridiculous to the sublime, and <laughs> I am very excited to be with you and very thrilled to talk about your new book, Muhammad. And we were together last week at, uh, at the United Nations. Yes, uh, we're both sustainable development goal advocates. It could have been SDG beggars uh, also, because <laughs> we both are in that business as well, begging for some attention to this. You've written a book called The World of A World of Three Zeros. I thought it was about U.S. politics at first. <laughs> uh, but it's far more uplifting, that's for sure. It's, it's a wonderful book. The New Economics of Zero Poverty, Zero Unemployment, and Zero Net Carbon Emissions. Okay. How do we do it? Give a, give a glimpse. Don't give away uh, all the punchline. No spoilers, but um, 
but I'd like you to... Uh, no, I'll give you all the punchlines you know, <laughs> very quickly. Basically, uh, I raised the question uh, from wealth concentration, the way it's expanding, the way the wealth is being more concentrated more and more. Uh, people are aware that the, there is a concentration of wealth, but many people are not aware that it's get, getting bigger and bigger and bigger for, for a smaller and smaller number of people. Uh, that's worrisome because it, it, it creates a ridiculous kind of world. You cannot call it an economy anymore. It look, looks like from outside it's a plundering. You take everything and put it there outside, uh, up in the top. Uh, in the past, we, in our textbooks and so on, we talked about the champagne glass, that there is uh, so, many, uh, so much of wealth that for so, such a small percentage of people. And then the stem for the rest of the world. So. And I feel it's, uh, even that champagne glass analogy doesn't really fit into the picture. Uh, it's basically a growing thing. Champagne glass doesn't grow. So that's why I say it's a, too quickly that I thought maybe it's a mushroom. The huge mushroom getting more huge and controlled by fewer and fewer people. And the stem that comes out of the mushroom, there's the 99% or 99 99.5% people there, and that's what their, their wealth is. So this is a kind of uh, unacceptable way and very destructive way in society to be built. And the worrisome thing is that mushroom is continuously getting expanded, bigger and bigger. And I said this is sort of a ticking time bomb. Societies cannot continue in a situation like that. You a pent up anger at the bottom. Somewhere it will explode. And you'll see it in politics, you'll see it in the social relationships with people, you'll see it in the way daily life of the people and so on. And in a way I was shocked by the Brexit first time. It's almost like that kind of thing happening, saying that no no this we don't want anybody from East Europe to get in. They are taking away our thing. They're taking our income, taking our jobs. Who are complaining? Complaining of the people who are at the bottom because they don't know where they are struggling, losing jobs, temporary situation for each one of them. They are blaming the outsiders as if they are the responsible. And the politicians are fanning that. Yes, that's what the reason is. And the solution the politicians prescribe, let's get out of the European Union. That will solve everything. They're not touching the real subject. They're getting into some fictions that this is what, and that fiction became reality. And it created Brexit, and which is a kind of unheard of situation where world should be getting together. Now they are getting isolated, become real islands. And today they are islands to distinguish distance from the people coming from other European countries. Tomorrow that will come inside of their own country. They will be looking for another corner where to go. Until you touch the real subject, real subject is the machine, the economic machine that we built, is the one which is kind of sucking up everything, is designed for that purpose, and they're doing, the machine is doing the thing that is designed for, and it's passing on to the people, fewer and fewer people on the top. So that's what the main, main worry was, and I was looking for what are the ways to solve that problem? Is there any way? People in the past talking about um, tax the rich and distribute to the poor. Maybe, uh, but the, who will be taxing them? Because when you control all the wealth, you control all the power too. This wealth is not just an isolated, um, innocent thing. It's a very um, effective um, a concentration of uh, all the power that it represents. So you control the politics, you represent, control the government. So you're asking now government to tax you. You won't do that. You'll make sure that there are 101 ways how to explain that away and stay out of that. And, and here we have a cabinet filled with billionaires planning their next tax cut. Yes, tax cut. So, so that sounds kind of depressing situation. The, luckily, the, what time that what we are doing in Bangladesh to microcredit, Grameen Bank, I have gone through some experience which gave me some, some kind of feeling that maybe this could be addressed in another way. Then I looked at the explain, explanation that uh, the basic feature that destroys all this uh, in the real world is the misinterpretation of human being 
in the economic theory. Mm-hmm. This assumes that they are driven by self-interest. And that's a key word that we always use, self-interest. And everything is <clears throat> built on that self-interest. I said, what happened uh, to the other interest human being has? Human beings not only has self-interest, it also has a broader interest, uh, which we call uh, selfless interest. One is a selfish interest, uh, to kind of add to that, is a selfless interest. If we think human beings represent both these interests, then the economic world should represent that. But the economic world doesn't represent that. It represents only one interest. So since it represents one interest, it became more and more aggressive in pursuing self-interest. And it turns into greed. It turns into ignoring and avoiding every other responsibility whatsoever in the name of capitalist system. So that's what I was saying. Why don't we bring in selfless interest into the marketplace and say we can create business to solve problems? And I have done this unknowingly, not that I had any theoretical th- mind uh, behind it. Simply in order to solve problem, I started creating businesses, one after another. I created more than 60 such businesses in Bangladesh. And they have a common feature. None of them I have created to make money for me or anybody else. It's all focused on problem solving. I said, what about problem solving business? That may be the escape route for the selfless uh, part of human being. We can create more and more of them, and then we can solve, start solving problem if we only allow the selfless part to come into the marketplace. So that's what I've been arguing, and we call it social business. Social business can be a way. The next point I was saying, again, came from my own experience. Uh, we have given loans to poor women, $30, $40 to start a business. Uh, now we have 9 million of them in Bangladesh. And of course, throughout the world, there are millions and millions of them. Then we see their children of these families, the second generation. We help them to go to school, get education, give them education loan, get good education. Then they get very frustrated. What is the job? We don't have job in Bangladesh. What do we do? I got very worried. What is the solution for that? Then I started saying something abruptly by saying, why are you looking for a job? Job is the wrong idea. You should tell yourself, I'm, a job, I'm not a job seeker, I'm a job creator. Behave like a job creator. They were puzzled. Mm-hmm. Then I said, look at your mother. If nine million illiterate women from rural areas can start a business with loans of $30, $40 and become an entrepreneur, why of all this education and all this knowledge, you want to work for somebody else? Why don't you just go back to your mother and learn from her? Your education system is completely wrong. So now we create a social business venture capital fund, ask the young people, come with business ideas. If you don't have business ideas right away, go and talk to your mother. <laughs> she has a lot of she'll money. tell you anyway Absolutely. She, she's doing it she's the she's the in-house expert for uh, in-house consultant for you to tell you how to do the whatever she does you can make it 10 times 50 times bigger than what she does because she didn't have that capacity to understand and keep records and plan and so on so you have that with education so now thousands of these young people are coming so i said it, uh, capitalist system did it in two wrong ways one misinterpreting human beings and then Second one, misdirecting human beings to work for somebody else. I said, human beings are not born in this planet to work for anybody. We are built to be problem solvers. We are go-getters. We are hunters, gatherers. That's what we were. This is our history. This is how we grew. We never sent job applications when we were in the caves. <laughs> the job application from cave number five to cave number ten. <laughs> Do you have a job? A transfer, me? right? Yeah. <laughs> So I said, that's where history is. So I said, these are the basic elements that I was saying. If you put this into the picture, suddenly the question of oil concentration doesn't look as horrendous as it does right now. We can bring out our selfless part of us and create a world of completely differently, which addresses all the problems that we see, the problem of poverty, problem of unemployment. And I keep saying, unemployment... It's a, it's a wrong word to, to begin with because if you're not looking for employment, there is no unemployment. Because we are looking for employment, that's why we created unemployment. <laughs> if we're all entrepreneurs, the question of unemployment doesn't exist. And someday, when, uh, years later, when we'll have 3-0 established, 
We have to get to the third zero. Yeah, third zero is the one with the carbon emission. We are talking about a huge problem, and of course it's a huge problem. I said again, each individual can participate in it. It's not just the big companies have to do it. They have to do it because they are the emitter of the, uh, the carbon. But individuals in a daily lifestyle saying that uh, we will buy things which are green, which uh, they will put that this is like a declaration they make. In the, so I can only, I will go by my own choice, I'll buy the green stuff. Or there will be yellow stuff that we are not quite sure how much damage it does. I'll stay out of it. And there will be red stuff that I'll not even touch it. Mm-hmm. So I'll start doing that. My children will be learning in the classrooms that I want to build, make a life for myself in a way it doesn't harm any other lives anywhere in the world. So if, as long, if you feel I'm okay, but somebody in some other island country or some like country like Bangladesh, which is being washed away with the floods and cyclones and so on, becoming unlivable. We are talking about the uh, climate refugees because you can't live in your country because it's, uh, it's not possible for you to live there with the um, seawater entering your land and taking away your cultivable, cultivable land, all the salinity getting into your in a country like Bangladesh. So we can do that. And also, at the same time, we can create massive number of social businesses to address that issues. Simultaneously, what we tame the big businesses to restrain them, at the same time, we do the positive action. And we did that in Bangladesh, where we created social business uh, uh, Grameen uh, Energy Company. Grameen, uh, we call it Grameen Shakti, or energy, to bring solar energy in the rural areas. Very simple idea, to bring solar energy. We create uh, a business and start selling solar home system. And we tell the villagers that uh, uh, whatever money you spend on kerosene every month, give that money to us. We give we'll you help solar you get home a panel. System. You get a panel, yep. you get it. Now, uh, within Grameen Shakti itself, there are more than 2 million homes already uh, at the solar home system. And it is growing. And we became, um, several years back, the largest uh, off-grid uh, energy system in the whole world because nobody else is doing it. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's not doing it. So this is it's done in a way. It's a, uh, you cover your cost. You continue people. It makes sense to people. You are only paying whatever you are paying anyway for your kerosene. So this is one way, to uh, just one aspect of it. Then, of course, uh, biodigesters and other things that you can do, uh, cooking stove use that afforestation as a social business. And a very interesting thing as a social business. Now, deforestation is the nature right now. In every country you go, it's a deforested. We were visiting Haiti, and yeah. only 2% of forests left in Haiti. And they were telling me in the next 5 to 10 years, this 2% will disappear. It will be completely barren. 20 years, 25 years back, there were still 25% of the forest there. But now came to this. But you can re- re- revitalize the whole thing by building whole forests. It's economically sound. It may not bring you tons of money right away, but you, if you're not interested in the greed part of it, if you're interested in the solving part of it, it can be done in a very sustainable way. So these pieces can become feasible. I uh, mentioned that if you take off your glasses with dollar signs that you see the world with the dollars <laughs> everywhere. You only see whatever you make money. Uh, the moment you take it off and put on a social business glass, suddenly you see the enormous opportunity to create business to solve problems. So that's the perspective I wanted to give. give ah, that's to beautiful. Yeah. It, you, actually, you reminded me... Uh, when you talk to these Wall Street uh, yeah. folks, I don't know, some, I'm sure some, some here, I, I went to a hedge fund conference that I found to be amazing in, in this mindset yeah. uh, issue because there was a very clever money manager on, uh, on the stage and he was discussing how his portfolio works. <laughs> and he was talking about foreign policy and uh, crisis between this country and that country. And for me, I was getting into the story and thinking, oh my God, how do we get the diplomats there? Maybe there'll be a crisis. And his conclusion was, therefore, it's absolutely necessary to 
short the chrono and buy the end. You know, <laughs> and no matter what the story was, it came it down came to the down dollars at the end. Again, yeah. And it takes a certain so, kind of genius. Yeah. Like that. Yeah. Unbelievable, yeah. actually. I couldn't. I'm an economist. I can't. You're an economist, too. Can't do can't it. Do it yes. You know, it's yeah. a, it really yeah. is a, a problem. So you mentioned uh, that, that you have a venture capital fund for social business. How does that work? Who puts money in? How does something like this get started? Because really, uh, selflessness in economics... It, is, it sounds like a wonderful idea, but it reminds me of uh, a little bit of uh, the, the very famous uh, line of uh, Mahatma Gandhi when he was asked, uh, you know, what do you think of Western civilization? And he said, it would be a good idea. Uh, <laughs> uh, and so uh, what do you think of selfless economics? It would be nice, but... Who's going to do it? So how how would something like this work? You have a venture capital fund. Who's put money into it? it is this? I I beg for a living, so I'm uh, happy to beg always. Should we be begging, uh, or is there a systems approach that uh, you think? How how could something like this not only take off because clearly you've started a lot of social businesses and. We meet people all the time, and uh, one of my colleagues, uh, Tony Annette, uh, with whom I work, we meet people who want to do wonderful things. But it's not often sim- it's often not simple, I should say, uh, to, uh, to to actually find the resources. Uh, my wife, uh, Sonia, you know, yeah. we beg for community health workers, uh, and people just are able to say no, even when you tell them it's saving lives, it's crucial, and so forth. So how how to do it? Yeah. Uh, this is another part of the book, that uh, my experience in answering that question or looking for that uh, answer. Um, when we are talking about the social business, immediately people say, oh, nobody will be interested. If you're not making money, who, why should anybody do social business? I said, well, it's because uh, the only thing you ever heard is making money. If your mind is about money, you have the glasses with the dollar sign. You don't understand anything else. Uh, but if you can take off those glasses, probably suddenly you'll start feeling that there is another kind of thing. Yes, you did. <laughs> that helps a lot. Right. <laughs> that helps. Uh, oh, wow. <laughs> Good evening. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. I said making money is a happiness. We all have uh, experienced that happiness. Making money is happiness, but making other people happy is a super happiness. If you feel that, it will come from you. I don't have to go and beg or anything. I'm not asking for you to come and help and move on with your life. I'm saying that it's in you. You will be changing yourself. Uh, saying something is one thing, but actually feeling it, seeing it is something else. Uh, we created a lot of those social sort of businesses on our own. But the funny thing was when big businesses started paying attention to us, out of blue, they said, well, I'm interested in social business. So I got very suspicious. Mm-hmm. Maybe this is another twist that something happened and they'll start making money out All right, of it. What did I do wrong? What did I do wrong? <laughs> But the, the more we uh, be, be tough, we saw that no, genuinely they really wanted to do that and very seriously do that. And the first one was Danone. We created yeah, yeah. together. So you Maybe were, you could describe that. It's yes, a wonderful this, project. It's a wonderful project. It's, a, it's to address the uh, malnutrition in Bangladesh. But almost half the children in Bangladesh are malnourished. This is Bangladesh not alone in that. You go to any country, you'll see that almost in the similar proportion, half and half. Uh, so when Danone became interested, we were looking for what problem that Danone can solve. We have gone through many, many options and then finally focused on the malnutrition because it comes easily with them. The idea was to create a very special kind of yogurt. Danone is a yogurt company, milk product company, so yogurt comes very easily to them, and create that company to produce that yogurt. But this is a very special yogurt. Yogurt to solve the problem of malnutrition. How do you do that? You put all the micronutrients which are missing in the children into this yogurt and make it uh, cheap, once you decide to make it social business, there are, suddenly you find many ways you can make it cheap. If you want to make money, you start adding many frills. 
so that people can be attracted to that. They are asked to pay higher price. On we didn't need any fields. We just go to the basic and so on. Uh, so we created that. And now children love it. And we still want to make it cheaper than what the cost of production is uh, to reduce the cost of production. We did as much as we could. But then we had a marketing strategy. Marketing strategy is in the cities, we do the, to the grocery store, supermarket, uh, very um, posh yogurt from Danone. Every, all the wealthy people want to eat it. And market price of the yogurt, they pay. And we, we make a lot of money on that. And we then use this money when we do the rural areas, cross-subsidize it, make it, sell it in less than co cost of production because it's being covered by this. So it becomes easy. And we hire the, or engage the women in the villages to sell this door-to-door -door because poor people don't come to the grocery shop or in the marketplace. So we said we go to them to sell this. So now that is happening and it becomes very popular brand of uh, yoga. So this is one. Yeah, that's a good model. This is one, and then it led to many other things, because once it, and it, in another country it became a, a soup, a fortified soup for the children, school, uh, midday school food. Uh, they provide the soup, but fortified soup, so that the malnutrition can be addressed. In other uh, country, uh, uh, in Colombia, is panela. Panela is a sugar cane based uh, drink, you take a glass of hot water, put the panela, sugar cane sweet, put it into it and drink it all day continuously. So they thought, why don't we use this idea, make a fortified panela, and then serve it in the schools. When the children try to drink water, they will be drinking this water, and the school authority will be buying this panela uh, anyway. So this is the fortified panela, which doesn't cost much. You add that. So they do that, and you are using this uh, as a technique to bring it. So this is a social business idea. So many such social business ideas. McCain is another company, uh, which is a, a, a French fry company. It's a Canadian company. They became very interested. It's a, it's a family-owned company. They be, family became very interested in the idea of social business. Uh, they said, what can we do? So I didn't know much about McCain. They explained to, her, explained to me that uh, wherever, if you eat French fry in anywhere in the world, remember you're eating McCain French fry. Mm -hmm. I said, my God, you are big. He said, yes, we are big. 60% of the French fry market we cover, cover in the whole world. Uh, and, but we want to do social business. So we worked with them uh, to create the social business in Colombia to make the farmers produce more and get more uh, revenue out of them and make, connect them with the international market and so on. But it got into their head, McCain head. Now they start seeing social business opportunities. The glass, difference of the glass now. Mm -hmm. Started seeing the social business opportunities. They have been in this business for many years but never saw these opportunities before. Then they came to me, they said, look, did you know that 26% of the uh, potato grown in France is thrown away. Six percent cannot be picked up from the ground because our machines don't pick them up, or the farmers' machines don't pick them up. And 20 percent, because we don't buy, any other French fry company do not buy because they are wrong shape. It doesn't fit into our machines, so we don't buy them. Mm -hmm. If we don't buy, they cannot sell, so they just throw away. Now that we have become social, interest, social business interested people, we say, why are you helping people to throw away good food? So we decided to create a new social business in France to buy up all these throwaway potatoes and create small implements to pick up the potato who's left behind, not the big machine, implements, yeah. and hire the uh, unemployed young people in France to run the business and use the potato, make potato soup. Soup doesn't need a, a shape. A shape. Yeah. So this is, and it Wonderful. became a very popular soup in France. And that led to another thing. 30% of the vegetables grown all over Europe is thrown away. For the simple reason, they do not look to be in a good shape. The shape is very important for vegetables. If the cucumber is fat on one side and thin on the other side, nobody will buy it <laughs> in the supermarket. Yeah, I, I hate that kind of cucumber. <laughs> I wouldn't touch it. <laughs> 
and in the in the business in their own business vegetable business these are known as ugly vegetable <laughs> imagine that i said why you call them ugly vegetable they said well if you want to put it in the grocery, uh, supermarket your vegetable has to be in military formation they have to exactly say <laughs> that's how consumers like it pay for it uh, what have we done <laughs> so it, you know it's very interesting uh, and i think a point you made that i want to underscore yeah. that with the danone yeah. you were able to make something very cheap because yeah. it wasn't looking for profit and of course in most of our textbooks it says the opposite that it's you know the search for profit cuts the costs uh, yeah, yeah. drives down sure. the cost through competition yeah. but we're running a crazy experiment in this country that uh, you know well which is that unlike the healthcare systems in all of the other uh, high income world ours is based on private yeah private motive at least more than half of it and we have by far the most expensive healthcare, healthcare system, system in the world and it will become for more the expensive. same exact services Services. delivered yeah. we're paying thousands of dollars per more. person more, more per year yeah. and it's a crazy thing because all we have to do is look at how it's done elsewhere yeah. and it's not for profit exactly. it's it's run on a sure. uh, on on a uh, uh, a non-commercial basis, basis because it's a public good and a public That's service and service. here of course it's run on we've got to make the market work better every time we make the market work better the price goes up a thousand times for yeah. these yeah. the drugs and all the abuse and and so forth sure. so the mindset is definitely a part of it if you have this capacity to exploit market sure. power which these companies do exactly. and so it's exactly uh, yeah. an illustration Now, just of completing this, this uh, mccain business of vegetables so they moved from not only potato now they got into vegetables so they're going into cross they started buying yeah. all those ugly vegetables in this new company is a social business company what they do they chop them off yeah yeah make a small packet of ready to cook vegetables <laughs> when you chop up the vegetables you don't know the shape right <laughs> there's no way you can hate them anymore it's good food <laughs> i hope everybody's taking notes not on, not only on how to cook soup but also uh, on uh, thinking about uh, all the the missing opportunities and the wastage industries make in the world is enormous just because they don't do sell it in the market and so on just throw it away so now this is the two cases of potato and vegetables and about your healthcare we started a small program in new york city called gramin america to give loans micro loans like we do in bangladesh and everybody said it will never work in this country it worked beautifully it started in 2008 uh the branch became self sustaining in within 5 years we created many other branches seven branches in new york city 20 branches in total all over the united states in many many other cities 11 cities and today we have over 100 million 100000 borrowers all women and they have received nearly 1 billion dollars in loan repayment is near 100% 99.5% 6% and so on so this is one that you know that this is happening this is a, and all the branches are sustainable economically it's not that there somebody is dishing out money for them the point i was to make one of the thing that we tried to do bring healthcare because these people don't get the healthcare even after obama care yeah, of course even after obama care they're disconnected, disconnected from the system disconnected from the system so we said we have to provide it because the system is not caring for that so we started caring so now a new social business healthcare system everybody is chips in and they take care of it, each other and the health full system is in place right now in one of the trial branches if it comes as a sustainable level then we start repeating with every micro credit branch we'll have the healthcare program there's no reason today healthcare can be provided almost costlessly if you bring your technology you bring anything all the possibilities that but the commercial interest in that will not make it happen your cell phone is a mobile phone can become a source of your entire healthcare system 
and you get wherever you are all the healthcare possibilities is possible for that and this can be delivered at home we talk about artificial intelligence to remove people from the work and so on if you put artificial intelligence to serve the healthcare program you don't need any of those facilities that you have literally you can access that it's a question of your mind what which direction you are looking at that's what i was trying to explain is if you re- re- refocus our mind into looking at this realizing that i can bring all my creative power all my business power to solve all these problem or problems will be solved that's why i keep saying it's possible to have a world with three zeros zero poverty zero health uh, unemployment and zero net carbon emission so that's argument so I, what i was explaining that it's not something you go and convince i have not convinced dano they came to me i didn't know anything about dano I I ask I was asking who are you because I have not I am not familiar with this company when McCain came I asked the question what kind of business you do mm-hmm. then they were telling me do you like french fry I said yes I like french fry <laughs> then say 60% of the french fry we supply to the world so wherever in the world you eat french fry now on you remember you most probably were eating then uh, mccain french fry so those companies came out of there now many more companies coming many more young people coming with business ideas to solve problem is initially it's a small one but suddenly it can grow now because it's a business it just covers its own cost it's a question of now replication question of now uh, doing it multiple of them and then all the problems solved you're seeing a kind of uh, ecology where the quote normal business sector continues this new business sector social business sector lives alongside sure. it sometimes living in symbiosis sure. and it's also you're saying a, a way to uh, tame the uh, the evil side of uh, of the the, the uh, money only corporate sure. world because they can get involved they also can get involved also because it is a it's a very interesting uh cases set of cases that you're talking about um a lot of the businesses have no idea yeah what is needed why there are problems what's happening in their society i hope this will give them idea i i went uh, to uh actually even a not for profit i won't mention who and where but of one of the big chains of uh, health providers to the cfo uh and talked about a way to address the very poor people in the environs of this mega hospital complex he said we're not interested in that category yeah. this is a ho- not for profit hospital yeah. by the way right. yeah. he said we lose 3 cents per medicaid uh, patient so we're we're not really interested in building up that line of business but that's the hospital that's in in the neighbor- that, yeah. in the neighborhood exactly so you bring the technology you bring the creativity all these problems can be handled in a much different way than we now do because our business schools are always teaching how to make more money for your shareholders and so on and so forth i said well you run your business school to teach young people to serve those uh, companies to make the shareholders earn more money why don't you have another degree social business mba so that they can learn how to create business to solve the problem now you started some of those centers yes, yes no. how how Series are you doing it what's the very good uh, when i'm here for the un meetings and other meetings uh, i am contacted by uh, one of the leading universities in the country here they want oh, to start a center in a university in a, setting right here to start a social business center because the students want it they want to see they are fed up with the kind of things we are teaching them this is a business school they are fed up with this kind of they are looking for ways how to change it so we thought we'll offer this let them judge whether this is something they would like to do so young people come with the frustrations because they see this there's no end to this all i can do i can get a job and serve the company and i get a good salary good home and car and so on that's end of it but they have so much power right now with the technology in their hand the creative power in their position they can do anything they want as big as they want but job doesn't allow them to do that job what job allows them to do that is to become uh, mercenaries mercenaries for wealth concentration because i'm helping you to become richer than you you, you were yesterday today you'll be more and that's how i've been taught in our classroom and so on so i said our education system has to be redesigned so that we 
we have all the options on our table. So that yes, I can be either a, an employee of a company or of an office, or I could be an entrepreneur by myself. If you, if you, if you don't have to accept that all human beings are entrepreneurs, the way I'm saying boldly, because I'm, I'm saying, why do I say that? Because I've been, I've been seeing it again and again. All the women who joined Grameen Bank or any microfinance bank, millions of them all over the world, they're not looking for jobs. All they do, take loan and start a business. And if this illiterate woman or hardly, hardly um, familiar with the business world, they can start a business and move up step by step. Uh, if, you, if you just go in your neighborhood to see the Grameen branch in New York City, you'll see the women who never had the idea that she can run a business suddenly become a businesswoman and has calculations and so on everything. So what are we doing in our schools? Why can't we inculcate those kind of feelings in, inside the young people? This is an option for you. So you kind of weigh uh, what option you want to take. So people are looking for that. So I would say that the universities, academic institutions are doing that, and they are looking forward. And they, in, in, they're having social business competitions, global competitions, so come up with the competition. I said, you don't need to have the money first. Idea is the important thing. Idea is the force behind the power behind the social business. If you have the right idea, many people will say, this is such a great, I would like to invest. Where did the investment money comes? I'll give you a story of Danone okay. again. I'll Good. give you just such a simple story, but such a powerful story to me. We created, we agreed both sides, Danone and ourselves, to create this company in Bangladesh back in 2005. And we registered the company and have all the legal formalities done. And we put our half a million dollar in our bank, in the company's bank account. But the Danone doesn't do the half a million. With such a big company for half a million, this is nothing for them. Why are you waiting? We waited and waited. Didn't. So we started calling them, writing them letters. They said, yes, we have some problems. Give us some time. Mm -hmm. so lawyers. We, yes, lawyers. <laughs> lawyers says company. Been, been there, done that. Yes. <laughs> lawyers says company cannot do the uh, investment in this company because company declares upfront it will never give you any dividend. Right. Shareholders <laughs> give you the money to make more money out of their money. So you will be violating the mandate of your uh, shareholders. So they have to stop. What they came out with a brilliant solution to that, they wrote a letter to all the shareholders of the company, some 3,000 plus shareholders, before their general, you know, general meeting, saying that this year will give you such, a, such an amount of dividend, company did very well, etc., etc. In the end, they said, we are trying to create a company in Bangladesh. Uh, it, it will be a social business company to solve the problem of malnutrition. We need half a million dollars to put into that company. If you are interested, here is a box. You put a tick mark in your box and tell us what percentage of your dividend you would like to invest in this. Mm -hmm. It's up to you. This is a not a required thing. 98% of the shareholders signed up. It brought 35 million euro. <laughs> we needed only half a million dollars. 35 million euro. And it created a second round of problem. Employees all around the world, hundreds of thousands of employees of the Lord protested very strongly to the company, saying, do you consider us second-class citizen? You asked the shareholders to participate in this project in Bangladesh. You never bothered to ask us, as if we don't matter. So the company was forced to write another letter to the employees. Out of that, another 30 million euro came. So there's a 65 million euro. Now what to do? Now what to do? <laughs> now oh, my God. Do, you see? We are talking about... Not having, they are <laughs> confronted with a separate problem. So they created social business fund. Today, out of that fund, many social businesses are created in many different uh, countries to the fund. And new money is keep coming from the shareholders and also from the employees every year into the fund. So if you raise the question in a proper way, people come up. That's it. Money is not the problem. Problem is here. What do you want to do with your life? That is the basic question. If you resolve that question, everything else is solved. Thank you. Can microfinance be also part of the channel? 
yeah. for financing? Sure, it is. It, of course, it is. It is. I mean, so, so a social business can take a loan, repay a loan. Sure. Right. Okay. The idea, though, is that it's social in the sense it's not distributing dividends. It's exactly. a not-for-profit company. Yeah, right. Uh, we created Gamin Bank uh, as a social business because we don't the want to. The phone. Gamin phone, we wanted to make it social business, totally, but we couldn't. There's, uh, one third of the company shares is owned by a social business. Okay. So all this money, when you ask, where is this money coming from, is coming from the, all the dividend that we receive from the Gamin phone, it goes into all this investment that we make. In them. So we have a ready source. And there are many other sources that we have. We, businesses make profit, like uh, we, have a, uh, we started with the IKR Hospital to take care of the cataract yeah. operation. So that came to the profit-making position, it came to the break-even point, and it's creating more and more. So we collect those money, we started setting up the next one, next hospital. So now we have four hospitals running. And four hospitals are paying back all the investment. In social business, you have to return the money that is invested in you. But you can't take any dividend, simply you get your money back, that's all. So when you get your money back, you invest it in another social business. But so you do pay back the of course, capital or, put Absolutely, in. otherwise it's not a business. You have to return your investment money. And it should be running its own money. So this is okay. so the break-even point for us is a very important point. After that, money comes back. Right. So, so that that money we used to create, uh, to reinvest it to create another hospital. So now four hospitals will be paying back soon. All of them now two hospitals pay back. Others are still coming to the break-even. All this money goes into creating a second hospital, third hospital, fourth hospital. So you have a series of hospitals coming out of the same money that mm -hmm. we invested. Okay. So this is the power of the whole thing. Yeah. How does it relate to Islamic finance? Uh, it's it's got yeah, some similarity, doesn't it? I don't know. I'm not very familiar uh -huh. with that. I don't want to. Because it is a, a no interest yeah. idea that you pay back, but there's no interest being paid back. So it's it has a certain... Maybe, maybe, yeah. but uh, okay. I will not uh, go details into it because uh -huh. I'm not comparing it. Yeah. This is a religious... Amazing. Yeah. So, so the, what's the next step? Next step is to let people know, make okay, decisions. Okay, you, you guys are the next step. Yeah, absolutely, they have to make decisions. They, they have to go back and tell their children first, don't be a job seeker, be a job creator. Or you have two options. You can be an employee, you can work for somebody, or you could be uh, on your own, on, create a company yourself. So which we, that message we don't give in, the, in our families, that message is not given in, the, in, in our education system. I said that's a very powerful uh, message to give. Uh, and then create appropriate financial system. So just simply I want to start a business will not make it happen unless somebody provides me the investment money to st start that. If today an unemployed young person in New York City with a brilliant uh, business idea, goes to a bank, give me the money, I have a brilliant idea, I want to start this business. He will be thrown out of the uh, uh, bank. And the security will be called in to get him out because he's a crazy guy. He's asking for something. So that, that's the kind of financial system we have because that financial system gives money to people who already have lots of money. Right. Make more money. So that's the direction it's in. It doesn't go to the bottom. Almost half the population of the entire world has nothing to do with the financial system. They're on their own. So that is the critical point in the But whole. how do you how do you run a social bank or a social venture capital? By what criteria? How do you judge if you're the banker that's a good social Again, business because you do have a yeah. credit limit and yeah. Um, yeah. what are the criteria that one should use just to give you a concrete example yeah. of uh, when we say to our young people uh, forget about jobs start a business on your own uh, that's what you are for you look at your mother etc and then uh, we said come up with business ideas so now they are coming with business ideas we create a social business venture capital fund and two principles we follow nobody will be rejected nobody nobody will be rejected so don't worry that, oh, I, I may not get the money. You'll get the money. Nobody will be rejected. Anybody who is a person that wants to start a business, has an idea, if your business plan doesn't sound right, we'll work with you until it comes to the level that you can take the money. So we are, it's not abandoning. It's, it's, it's not the rejection. It's taking you and make you uh, able to start the business. So that's one principle. Second principle is nobody is abandoned. Your business may fail, 
then we are, this social, uh, venture capital will not come and grab you and extract everything from you. No. We will help you to start again. Business means bi- failure is a part of business, so you don't be, af- don't be afraid of that. Uh, and go through it, and we'll be with you all along until you're successful. Then you start paying back the money that you had, and we, in the second round, you want more money, we'll give you second round money, third round money, we'll do that. And you'll be doing money, we'll be doing, it's not social business, you're doing business to make money for yourself. You are coming up. But when you come up, we have enough, then one idea that you would like to have, that maybe you will start a social business on the side. That's an obligation, but it's not something that you have to perform right away. You keep it in mind, because you came from that system, you oblige yourself that uh, you can do that. So this is what is being done, and then money goes out, and we have performance-wise is doing very well. We have now about 22,000 young people with this money, and every, every month you know, nearly 2,000 to 2,500 young people get funded from this uh, social business fund. So we, it's, it's becoming bigger and bigger every day. From one fund that you have One started. fund that we have yeah. created, yeah. This is Where is it based, actually? In Dhaka, in Bangladesh. Okay, yeah. so, and most of the business is in, in Bangladesh. Bangladesh? These are all in Bangladesh, okay. and we are encouraging. I said, I said, why should people be unemployed? Because of the system that we build. He has, no, he has looked for a job. And so when job doesn't come, so he says idle. I said, I cannot figure out why energetic, young, educated person at the prime of his life sit idle, do nothing. As if this, somebody <laughs> put a spell on him. Mm-hmm. That he cannot do anything. I said, the system has created such an aura around him. He cannot even think that I am a human being. I have, I have all the opportunities to do things on my own. Because that part I, we have taken away through our upbringing, through our education, with, through our broader economy that we have. Oh, no, you have to have a job. Otherwise, you are nobody. I said, no, job is something else. I am a person. I can do anything I want. And that helps a lot if you have a right kind of financial system. If you had that kind of social business venture capital, I keep saying that if you put money on the table, nobody will be an unemployed person. They said, yeah, give me the money, I'll start something. And in the beginning, not everybody will jump at it. Four or five of them, ten of them. If they are successful, the others will say, why am I sitting? I can start, I can do better business than he does. Exactly the way it happened in microcredit. In microcredit, women didn't run, rush to take the money. They were reluctant. Right. When they saw some women took it, then say, my God, she is doing it, but I can do it better. And then everybody came. This is how the whole system works. So that's the crux of the whole thing, that you have to create that environment in our education, in our uh, uh, bringing in the outer and institution. I said the whole problems of the capitalist system is happening because of the failure of the institutions. Uh, when it comes to poverty, one issue that I have been raising for many years, I said poverty is not created by the poor people. Poverty is created by the system. Poor people are as good as any other people. Simply they are rejected from the entire system. Nobody is connected with them. So you connect them, suddenly they are alive, suddenly they are as good as anybody else. There is nothing lacking in them. They sure work hard. Absolutely, harder than anybody else. The life is so tough. Harder. Yeah, harder than anybody else. Definitely. Absolutely. Has anybody uh, started this in in the U.S. or in Europe? Are you seeing an uptake of... Uh, when I came this time here, you're doing it. No, no, right. came here. Somebody said you are invited to a restaurant to have dinner with. I said, well, I don't know with the have time. But no, this is a social business restaurant in <laughs> New York. Okay. I said, I said yes. That's how to get Muhammad Yunus over to dinner. <laughs> <laughs> so you. So I went there uh, with my daughter and my friends. We went there. It's a beautiful restaurant. It's dedicated to social business. I said, how did you get that idea? I said, don't you remember we traveled together to Haiti? We would talk about social business in Haiti. <coughs> and she's a, she's a financial expert in world market. Mm-hmm. Young lady became very interested in the concept of social business. She said, what can I do? So, so I said, what I can do? I can create a social business restaurant. And my friends and everybody is very popular now. It's a three months old. It just began. It's beautiful. So it's not me pushing around anybody. Just got the idea. She traveled to Haiti, saw some social business examples, and got excited about it and do that. So reading this book, I'm sure many of people will come and do their own social business. I said, come up with that. And if, if, you, if you take, see, social business can be as small as you want. If you take 
three unemployed young people, create a business to solve this unemployment situation for them. It's not a big deal. And who are the people who are, emplo- uh, who are being employed by this restaurant? Ex-prisoners. Yeah. They are the ones who are running this business. So you say, I create a restaurant, hire the young uh, ex-prisoners, and this is a, I train them. And now I have a uh, whole uh, restaurant, uh, very good food, and everybody loves it, and they come in. So she thought about something, what she can do. So to create a business to employ three people and be sustainable mm-hmm. is not a rocket science. Anybody can do this here. They, everybody has money into their pocket to do this, such a thing. But we don't think that way. Oh, unemployment, that's a government issue. What should I do? Why should I do it? It's not a government issue, it's a human issue. I should be doing that if I, if I can afford it. If I can't afford it, I'll take five of my friends together. Let's do it together. If I can do three people out of unemployment, I can do 30 people out of unemployment. Because the system is the same. This is just a repetition. That's where the microcredit part became so interesting. Mm-hmm. It started a tiny little thing, and the rest of it is just a repetition. It's now a global phenomenon. And continues, like uh, Gamin America has done 1 million, uh, sorry, 100,000 borrowers. They are planning for the next year, they announced, they want to reach to half a million borrowers in the next 10 years. First 10 years is 100,000, next 10 years is two and, uh, uh, sorry, half, half a million. And their total amount loan they will put, uh, will disburse over $10 billion to serve these people. And I, I was asking how much money you need to lend money to, uh, to the extent of uh, $10 billion. Their calculations is $250 million. I said, can you find this $250 million? Oh, it will be tough. I said, why should it be tough? You have shown. <laughs> you have shown the result. Why should anybody be thinking where this $250 million be coming from if I can to reach half a million borrowers, reaching $10 billion loans, $10 billion loan with $250 million? I said, everybody should be running after you rather than anybody, anything else. You are serving the people who are unserved in every direction. You are reaching it to them. So that's the challenge. You create those examples, then the, you awake the whole nation, the whole society, that it can be done. One people, once people see that it can be done, everybody wants to join in. No doubt there's a contagion, contagion that we need to yeah. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. trigger and give people the ideas. Maybe this is what the Sustainable Development Goals can help to do also. Exactly, that's it. Yeah. Because it gives the idea, here's what needs to this be solved. To be done, so. Here are the kids that need school. Yeah. This is also a crazy thing, that we yeah. have millions and millions of kids not in school. Not in school. And social business to get them in school sure. is, a, is such an obvious Absolutely. obvious. Now technology makes it so much easier now. Bringing electricity to households. Yeah. These are... Very solvable, very practical problems. Can I change the subject? Go, please. Because uh, yeah. two weeks ago you emailed to me, I was grateful, and to many other people, uh, a terrible political crisis that you're observing of, of the Rohingya in uh, Myanmar. Yeah. And uh, you're taking the lead on this uh, globally. You've uh, really brought a lot of attention I thought it would be good for people to know, to hear from you, to understand what this is about and why it's happening yeah. and what we should be doing. Yeah, the well, world gets crazier and crazier. This is another instance of that crazy thing. This country is led by a Nobel Peace Laureate. Yeah. <laughs> and what a terrible thing is happening. I have an even crazier country, by yeah, the way. Yeah, I know. <laughs> That's why I say that you get Not led by a peace laureate, <laughs> but we can't even imagine yeah, how that happened. Absolutely, yeah. Suddenly, we see a stream of people running towards Bangladesh, leaving everything behind, dead bodies in the river floating, uh, slaughtered children in the rivers and so on, right next to our border. We can't believe that this is happening to our neighboring countries. Their only crime they have committed they have been living in this country for generations. They happen to be Muslim. They don't want the Muslims to live there. They want to throw them out. This is it. This is, this is it. They, they were citizens in that country right from the birth of that country. When the country was created, there's no problem at all. Like anybody else who lived there, they're citizens. Just any civilized country do that. They did that. But in 1982, military government, military junta, they said, you are not our 
citizen. They took away their citizenship. Before that, they were in the government, they were the cabinet ministers, they were in the parliament, they were in the political parties, everything just like any other citizen and very influential people. Now suddenly they are stateless people. That's okay. You did that. But then they, realized, then they started saying, you cannot live in this country. They tried many different ways. Suddenly, on the 25th of August, they did something terrible, and people started running for their life. And they started rushing to Bangladesh. And such an enormous number. As every day is 10,000, 15,000, 20,000. Right what now, triggered this, uh, this latest? The military, military attack, burning houses but and so on. Be, because Aung San Suu Kyi was there to give cover or because they that's just what, decided it was That's a, what she's doing. She has not said a word. Only statement she made, she addressed the nation. She said, I don't know why these people are leaving this country. The whole world knows what this yeah. people. The United States made a very clear statement. This is a, this is a textbook case of ethnic cleansing. This is UN statement. Uh, Secretary General made a statement. Uh, Macron, the other day, said it's a genocide going on in the country, President of France. So every other nation, every other world leader is saying that. Um, Security Council has con condemned that. So still nothing happens. She still stays the way she is. So that's when, out of desperation, I thought I'll get my friends together to raise our voice and raise it to the Security Council. And I'm very happy that you signed in right away as soon as I mentioned You, you. ask, I will sign, no, that's absolutely. for sure. No, but no, we were know. watching horrified it's and not, not really understanding. See, you, see, you see, you're seeing it from a distance. I'm right there. I'm right in this yeah. border. It's, I come from the same region. We from, speak that? This, from that region, yeah. I speak the same language. So when they're being interviewed in CNN, I get, feel like I'm the only one who understands their language. Nobody, uh, but this, this is crazy. This, they couldn't save anything, just rushed to save themselves. Mm -hmm. And most of the... Burning down the no, villages and villages, murdered villages people. Villages have murdered them, and dead bodies floating. You keep the record every day how many dead bodies you kept in the river. Uh, so that's, this is the situation in the, uh, Myanmar. And uh, uh, they, they simply deny that they have anything to do with that. Uh, Aung San Suu Kyi's government. We're saying, why don't you just come over? I'm, and I've invited uh, Aung San Suu Kyi. I said, come to Bangladesh, visit their place, and if you feel that this is the people who are coming from there, you tell them that Myanmar is as much as their country as your country, and you'd like to bring them back. Whatever has happened, I'll take you back. And that's the only way you can solve it. Otherwise, there's no solution. Then terrorism will grow now. Because they will try to get back, they will try to attack things. So you, are, you open up a Pandora's box now. You, you are a peaceful people, they're living there, they have no, you never heard of them in their life. Now suddenly we become uh, aggrieved, uh, they have to protect their life. The people who are coming, most of the people are women and children. What happened to the men? Still people don't know what happened to the men. Because all you see is stream of women and yeah. children coming. Wow. Yeah, that's it. Oh, my God. This is the situation. Did she right respond? Oh, the response, she addressed the nation. She said, we don't know why all these people... But has she responded to you? I tried, but uh, no response from her. No response? No response. We'll keep trying. Secretary yes. General? No, we have to... Yeah, we we'll talked to Secretary General. Yeah. We we'll talked to several leaders in the United Nations to draw their attention. This is something that I say, I'm quite, my message was, this has to resolve quickly. If it becomes longer and longer, it becomes more and more complicated, more and more explosive. And, and it will destabilize de the region because this is not going to end very easily. It will create a lot of tension in the region. Shocking. Yeah. Terrifying. Terrifying. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, let me turn to you. Uh, we have... Uh, Time for some discussion, and uh, I think there's a microphone uh, out in front. Yeah, perfect. And I would, uh, all I'd ask you, uh, please come up to the mic if you're interested. Uh, tell us who you are briefly. It, you can make a comment or a question. The only requirement is be brief so that others <laughs> can do it too. Don't hog the mic. Uh, but other than that, you're very welcome. Please. Good evening. Uh, Good evening. My name is Sohail, and uh, I've, my background is in structured finance and risk management. But I actually met Professor Yunus, if I could remind you for the sake of the question, because this is another bubble we are in here. I met you in Balakot in the earthquake in 2005. 10,000 people had died. 
And I thought that was an interesting experiment in creativity. All the work we did for delivering food, for prosthetics, for developing new homes. And I, I think I met you at the Marriott <laughs> amidst the circus and you gave me a hug, um, which I still remember. <laughs> but what is interesting is, so I've been testing your hypothesis on the social business without the dollar sign all those years since we met. So the, I think you should consider what the outcomes of that experiment were. If I go to DC or my, many of the eight specialists, they will say, no, all this work you've done is informal work. It is not creativity. It is not to be recognized because the only work we'll recognize is if you go to a school here and get a degree in entrepreneurship and then you work, say, for three years at USAID, that is formal recognized work. The rest of it is just all, you know, that is not creativity. So what I'm saying is your argument will run into these people who have their own vision and the tunnel vision that Jeff is talking about of not being able to connect, that you need to have some local knowledge of these countries. I mean, the yogurt example you're giving is fine. People will absorb it in one way. But as somebody who's lived there, yeah. yeah. Can you help me with, like, mediate that risk somehow? Yeah. Because the way you are looking at it, if you don't absorb those risks and address them and include people like me, you will keep getting these surprises where people keep thinking, oh, why is the world getting worse? I have a piece of advice you. for you, though. Yeah. Don't go to Washington. <laughs> That's a general piece of advice. Jeff, I went there because I came to the Earth Institute and I wrote an email and I have no connections or money to get a meeting with you. <laughs> yeah, Pay to, to play. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank well, you very think, much. Just, just a quick answer to that. I mean, when you do something uh, new, yeah. uh, you are uh, swimming against the current. So yes. you don't expect everything will be favorable to you. You have to be patient and aggressive to make it happen. So you need a lot of uh, that patience and uh, stubbornness to make it happen. So it's not easy because you are alone in your context. Uh, so it, uh, it takes a lot of time. So you connect with other people who are doing the social business to get some strength. Uh, probably it will encourage where are the way, where are the places which can you get sympathetic responses. How can I connect helping. with you? That, that, thank sure. you. Definitely you can do that. Great. Sure. Please. Hi. Um, I'm Sim. And when I was a little kid, when I was four years old, I met you in Ann Arbor, Michigan. <laughs> if you know, if you remember my uncle, Abdul Majid Khan. Yes. <laughs> but um, my question to you is, I know there's a lot of people in Bangladesh that view your international stature and your, um, and they, they, they see as a threat to their authority. Um, that's why they took over the bank from you. Um, but I, what I was, my question is, will you ever get into politics in Bangladesh? No way. <laughs> <laughs> That's no a way. cruel question. <laughs> and, and also, why would your, you do that? What is your role in Grameen Bank? Uh, not anything direct, because uh, I'm not holding any position within Grameen Bank. Uh, but they are my friends. We worked together for a lifetime, for 40 years. So these are not kind of uh, foreigners there. They're all close to us. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good evening. This good is evening. Uh, Farheen from Pakistan, which is quite similar in yeah, many ways to Bangladesh. Sure, I'm course. a graduate student in Columbia University, and I'm actually curious in exploring <laughs> how, um, what, what can be the government's role in uh, expanding the social business? How can this be a national strategy? Yeah. We try to explain that uh, government to hold a little bit so that uh, let people do it. Because uh, we have a history of government messing things up. So, so it would be good for the government to kind of keep a distance. And the role that I define for the government is you know, at best you become a cheerleader. So if something, somebody does good, you go and applaud them. This, you're doing good work. But don't try to help them. <laughs> because in the name of the help, uh, they do it in a very strange ways and they start taking command of you and so on. But the creativity of the individual is enormous, and you can do it yourself. Uh, let government wait to see how it happens. And later on, government may do their own social business, because government is not that they have to all, always give charity for everything. They can create their own social business too. Uh, for example, uh, creating those social business venture capital that I'm talking about for unemployed people that I want to be business. Not only unemployed, even the employed people who think you got caught into that. You'd rather be doing something else. If you have an opportunity, you say, I quit, 
I go into doing business. So they, they can create those funds, social business fund, social business, social, uh, venture capital, and all those kind of things. That would be the helpful thing to do. But the real energy is for the young people, and the young people with technology and with creative power, and design that and make it happen. Would you have the space to do this in Pakistan? Um, yes, definitely. I, there are actually a lot of uh, venture firms that are building, and especially on the uh, basis of technology, they're like different nest building firms, and I'm actually very interested in the idea as well. Yeah, great. That'll be great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Hello. Uh, thank you for being here. My name is Rifat. Uh, my mother is actually from Chittagong. Okay. I grew up in Dhaka myself. Uh, you know everybody. Yeah. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't anybody meet me when you were three? <laughs> <laughs> I love the work you do also. Oak Park, Michigan, anybody? <laughs> no? <laughs> okay. Um, I, I grew up in Dhaka, graduated in economics from Emory University, and currently an investment banker just down the street. Um, and I'd, I'd been very familiar with your work. I've read, read some of your other work on building a social business. I was a finalist for the Holt Prize uh, okay. last year. So I'm sure you're very familiar with that. And uh, very soon I'm hope, planning to leave finance in New York City and go back to Bangladesh Good. to enter the world of social business. Welcome. And thank you very much. Uh, I'm wondering if you have any, and I'm 22 years old, I have you know, my whole life ahead of me, but I'm wondering for a 22-year-old with, from, you know, who lived in the U.S. for the last 10 years, to go back to Bangladesh and trying to start something or be a part of something, whether you have any concrete uh, advice or perhaps opportunities. I know you mentioned the Venture Capital Fund. I'm familiar with Unicenter. But what are some of your thoughts for someone, and not just me being a Bangladeshi, but even if anyone Maybe. from abroad yes, want yeah. to go to Bangladesh or another developing country and want to be actively involved in that space, uh, what are your thoughts or what are your advices? Uh, you. One, you have to be very patient. Don't expect just because you came from the United States, all of a sudden everything is happening. Uh, it won't. You'll be very frustrated. Hold that frustration, continue. Finally, results will start coming. So that is the most important thing to remember, that everything will go against you. Nothing will come in favor of you. If you are in the right path, everything will be against you. If it's the wrong path, of course, everything will come your way. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let me give you one more tip. Yeah, that's uh, right. How many people here know the Sustainable Development Goals? Yeah, that's it. This is a yeah. random crowd, of course. <laughs> Just a random cross-section of New Yorkers. Uh, raise your hand. And how many are going to learn them in the next hour? <laughs> All the rest. All so good. the Sustainable Development Goals, and Mohammed and I are both SDG advocates for Secretary General Antonio Guterres. These are the goals that uh, all 193 governments agreed on as being priorities for the world for the next 15 years. That by itself should tell you, actually, the world agrees on basically nothing, <laughs> but did agree on these, so it's a good, good start. Good start. And the second point is that when they were adopted, they were adopted, the speaker that morning at the UN uh, was Pope Francis. That's another good sign, that this is a good thing, really a good thing. And when Pope Francis said, this is our moral responsibility, all 193 world leaders said, yes, we're on it. So I mean it as a very serious suggestion. These are uh, an orientation for things we ought to do. The one I've been spending the last few days yeah. on every day, uh, every hour, two of them actually, SDG 3, which uh, my wife Sonia and I work on very intensively. That's health for all. And you heard about social business in the health sector. SDG 4 is education for all. And it is to ensure that every child in the planet can get at least a secondary school education. And yesterday I met with a wonderful woman who founded something called Bridges International, which some of you may have heard of, which is a, a, uh, an education uh, NGO, uh, or it's a business actually. It's not quite a social business, it's a for-profit business, but they're doing a wonderful job in the slums of Nairobi. And it's exactly on helping kids that would have no chance for school to get access. And they were working on the price point. How can you provide 
a quality education at $4 per child per month because that's what the households could afford. That's very tough. You have to be really clever. She's a Ph.D. from Berkeley in, uh, um, in anthropology. Her husband is a, um, an MBA in, uh, in uh, education economics, and they're being very creative. But the point that I want to make is that we have a set of problems that really need solving urgently, and I believe that they're a very important orientation. And at least if you carry the calling card of sustainable development goals, Others will somehow know something about them, and that's our job also to help make sure that you know about them and carry that. And so I would just say that this is one thing to think about. Look down the list. What really grabs you when you go home and go to Bangladesh and, and look, you'll see lots of problems, lots of gaps, lots of things that need solving. And I think the core of Professor Yunus's uh, Insight is solve problems. Don't yeah. just sit there, solve problems. Yeah. Uh, and uh, the sustainable development goals, in a way, help to encapsulate what those core Thank challenges you, are. Thank you both. Thank you. Please. Um, Professor Sachs, Professor Yunus, it's an honor to be in the same room with you. My name is Daphne Erdal. Uh, I'm an environmental economist. I worked with the Turkish permanent mission to the UN as an advisor, and I currently work for an NGO that works with the uh, United Nations and has an eco uh, consultative status. Um, I have two questions for the both of you, actually. Uh, one, when we're talking about environmental issues, we say that uh, it's we should give the power to individuals as to we should be more educated consumers. Uh, when we decide what we're going to choose, we should be aware, and so we should be making the decision for the environment. Uh, I see a slight danger, or let me ask you, don't you see a slight danger in this when we put the responsibility on individuals, when in reality the cause for what's happening are the bigger industries and the companies currently? Uh, I feel that's kind of what happened with Michelle Obama when she wanted to uh, talk to the health and uh, to the food industry, and she was like, we should take the sugar out of the food and we should improve our health, and like, no, let's make people run. Let's make them do more exercise, then that's going to work. And I feel like if we tell individuals that it's their responsibility, I think it's important that we educate individuals and that I think in schools people should learn about this. The youth should be aware. But it's also kind of letting the industries and the big companies be like, well, it's on you now. It's individuals. You know, I don't have to do anything about great, it. Great question. Yeah. Mohammed. Yeah. Uh, I was great talk, question. talking about the role the individuals can play. That doesn't mean we are taking away the roles for the government, roles for the businesses, and so on and so forth. That's a very big problem. That's, that's where things have to be resolved in the legal issues and uh, oblig uh, compliance issues and so on and so forth. Uh, but the, I if we do all those responsibilities to the government and the businesses and people remain silent, not doing anything, that will not work. So we say it's everybody's job. Is it, and it's, the consumers are not just uh, people who are away from the business. The same person who is, as a consumer, performing his or her duty, he happens to be the CEO of the company too. Mm -hmm. So he brings his personal thing into the company also. Why am I doing this? And I'm running the business to upset everything. So uh, it, these are not a separate groups. Just because I happen to be a consumer, just because I happen to be a father or a mother or a son or a daughter, doesn't mean that I'm not involved in that. So all those people, that they have their families, they have their personal life. If they start practicing it, hopefully they will do it more inside the company to make it happen. That's the point I was making. I think Thank your you. question, if I could add a yeah. couple of thoughts in the, in the American political context. Our system is so corrupt, it's out of control. Uh, and if you ask why uh, Trump pulled out a Paris climate agreement, if it weren't for the corruption, you'd probably never even have heard of the Paris climate agreement because <laughs> the guy doesn't know very much. Uh, so what happened? What happened, the telltale sign of that was the week before Trump pulled out, he got a letter from 22 Republican senators that said, pull out. If you go to opensecrets.org, which is one of my favorite websites, which tracks who gives money to whom, these are 22 senators on the take. 
They're paid for by the oil and gas industry. If you take uh, Scott Pruitt, who is the jerk at EPA, that's a technical term. I'd like to speak technically. Uh, he has been on the take of the oil and gas industry all his career. Uh, so complete irresponsibility. So what do we do? This is really, this is why the U.S. is uh, in the situation where not because the American people don't know, some don't, but about 70% of Americans in every survey say invest in renewables. You know, people know that the climate's being wrecked. You have to absolutely be uh, under the, the control of somebody's big money not to have watched in the last two weeks the, the, the life and death issue we're facing. So this is really what we're up against. That's your question, what to do about it. I think there are many things, uh, and I think Mohammed's answer that every, everybody has to, I mean, every sense of this has to be brought to bear. Now, one idea which I would love to get going, maybe we need a social business to do it, and figured out exactly how to do it. Uh, we have two brothers in this country that people know about, Koch brothers. They fund lots of nice things in this city, by the way. Uh, they fund the Biodiversity Hall at the American Natural History Museum so that there's a museum after they destroy all of it. <laughs> <laughs> Honest to God, they own the largest private oil and gas uh, industry in the United States. They're terrible polluters, and they are the most irresponsible people in our country in terms of big money being put down to buy the Republican Party to stop any kind of action on climate. Well, I learned one thing. I don't watch enough TV, unfortunately, so I was in a studio watching TV, and um, they actually advertise how good they are, which is uh, a good sign because it means they have consumer businesses. Right? So we can boycott them because mm -hmm. they really like money, these guys. This is their real raison d'etre. They're $50 billion each. They've got the glasses on. They've got everything. They're just one walking dollar sign. Uh, and um, they own Georgia Pacific. Georgia Pacific is the pulp and paper company. They make tissue paper. They make toilet paper. They make things that get close to our skin. Why don't we stop buying that stuff? Really. That's part of the responsibility. We got to get organized. We haven't gotten organized. Why don't, there was, by the way, a shareholder resolution of ExxonMobil this past uh, board meeting that, that passed over the objections of the CEO that called on the company to report the risks to its shareholders of climate change stranding the assets of the company because they want honest financial reporting. So that's another way to go after it is the responsible investors, responsible consumers, political protest, which we really need to step up our game so that we don't have these maniacs that are wrecking the whole world. And I believe another way that's going to start coming is lawsuits, lawsuits, lawsuits. Any lawyers here, sue ExxonMobil, please. Make class action cases because look at the damage that this com company has done with their lies, with their deceit. And now people are paying with their lives and the Caribbean islands are being destroyed in the warming climate and the more intense storms and so forth. So I think the answer is we got to do everything. everything. And we've got to keep oriented to the good and make the difference of good and evil and keep the sense of responsibility. And when social business can do it, we've got to do it that way because that's self-help. That's actually getting in there. And when we need to use the law or politics or consumer boycotts, we have to do it that way as well. I think it's a great question. Thank you. Professor Yunus, Professor Sachs, lovely to see you both.
Dom sent me to say hello to you. Okay. Kunal sent me to say hello <laughs> to you. <laughs> I'm Laura Veronaka, and my question is, what tools... You're going to tell me where we met, though, right? At the UN. Oh, okay. Of course. Whoa, thank goodness. <laughs> All right, fine. Okay. What tools and words of wisdom can parents give their children to lead lives of service lives with creativity, and what can you tell your child to help them keep going when their business doesn't work the first time? Okay. Well, one uh, um, thing that parents uh, can do for the children uh, is to help them to uh, think about uh, their what kind of life they would like to have for themselves so that they can think, they can decide on their own, not parents putting that they, you should be a doctor, you should be an engineer, you should be like this, you should be a CEO. Instead of that, say, what would you like to do as they grow up, stage, stage by stage, not right from the first day they cannot answer that question. But as long as they are in the education process, this question has to come back again and again. Uh, what is the purpose of the life that you have decided for yourself? You have to have a purpose. Otherwise, you just leave for a day uh, just to survive. This doesn't make any sense. So you have to have a purpose and a grand purpose, something that you want to do for yourself while you are here. It's a, it's a very short period that we are here. So within that period, you want to achieve that. At the same time, also encourage the young people, both in school and in, uh, at home, to design the world they want to create, rather than they just take the world as given. world is not given. The world is created at every moment. And what kind of world they would make. Make a kind of wild imagination, not a, just a little bit of change here, so that they see that this is the direction that I have to take the world. In that, And then this thing, how do you do that? What will be the steps that you'll do that? Prepare yourself to make it happen. And remind these young people that you are the most powerful generation in human history. Because no other generation ever had so much power than the present generation has. Because of the technology that you have in hand. But as you have this power, make sure you use that power. If you don't use that power, it will be all wasted away. It will be a shame that you had it, you never used it. So a parent should encourage the young people to realize that they are powerful. And they should encourage that, make sure use their full power to make the things that they need to they see that they should do for future. So these are the things that the parents can do. Wonderful. Ladies and gentlemen, you heard it from Muhammad <laughs> Yunus. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Well, well done. Beautiful. Wonderful. Wonderful. Really beautiful.